Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling General Linear Models, Design of Experiments. And this is part six of a little mini-series that I'm calling One-Way Random Effects ANOVA. And we're going to use the R software to calculate everything we've done in the first five parts. And we're going to use an example from a book by Montgomery called Design and Analysis of Experiments. It's example 3.8. They're a textile company that weaves fabric on a large number of looms. You know, a loom is a machine that makes and weaves the fabric. They want the looms to be pretty homogeneous in the way that they make, you know, or, you know, weave the fabric. But they suspect that in addition to the usual variation in the strength of the fabric, that there may be some significant variations in strength between looms. So they want to investigate that. So they randomly sample four of the looms and they test the strength. And so that's what is represented by this. A is four, so there's four treatment arms or four factors. Well, it's one factor with four levels and there's four replicates. And here's the data and that's L1, L2, L3, L4 stands for loom one, loom two, loom three, loom four. Here's the column sums and column means. But to do this in R, we don't want it in wide format. We want it in long format. And so the reshape function allows us to do that. Ignore the row names. I wish there was an easy way to just leave those off. So this data is actually this data, but it's in long format. Now let's plot it and see what we have here. And so this is the data from loom one, loom two, loom three, loom four. And a couple things I'm looking at here is one, it's the variation within each loom. <clears throat> and I would say that it's, you know, you know, it seems like a constant variance, but there is a significant decrease in loom two. And that seems to be a little bit more than what's expected if the looms are producing you know, fabric strength that's pretty homogeneous. <clears throat> now, to reproduce what we did in the videos, we need to create a design matrix, and we'll call it X. And it looks like this. So this first column is all ones, which represents, you know, when you do the multiplication with beta, then it picks up the mu. And then this, is, this would pick up tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4. The dimensions are 16 by 5. The rank is 4 because the last four columns added together reproduced the first one. Now we're going to call, we're going to take the, the column fabric strength and just put it in a variable called Y. And actually doing this video, I learned about a function called replications. And if you put your model in it, and it, it will tell you how many times your data has been replicated, which is, may, may be useful. I don't know. Next, we in part one, we started creating perpendicular projection matrices. So first, we take the first column of X, which is the column of all ones. And then we create the perpendicular projection matrix onto that column space. So it's it's. You know, and one looks like this. It's just a factor of one. So J is one, tra one transpose, one inverse, trans you know, one transpose. And then that creates this J matrix. <clears throat> and Z is the column space of the f last four columns. So we take those and then create a, a perpendicular projection matrix onto the whole column space of X and it's actually under the column space of Z but since the first column is deep you know it's dependent vector on the last four it produces the same matrix and then we need the identity matrix now in part two we start calculating sums of squares so the sums of squares total is Y transpose I minus J Y and we get and when we 
calculate it, we get this, 111.9. Sum of squares treatment is y transpose m minus j y. Sum of squares residuals, 22.7. Degrees of freedom is the rank of that, you know, the, the matrix in the middle of the quadratic form. But since they're idempotent, it's actually the sum of the diagonal elements. And so that's what I'm doing here. So 3 and 12. The mean squared is the, the sum of squares divided by its respective degrees of freedom. And so that's what we get here. The F would be the, the ratio of the mean squares. And the P value is the area in the tail from that test statistic. So it's pretty small. So we're going <coughs> to reject the no hypothesis and conclude that there is some extra variation in the looms in fabric uh, strength. Now, oh, I wanted to do this. I want to now the in in part five I guess we showed that the test statistic is actually the same test statistic for the fixed effects ANOVA and so if we look at the fixed effects model here so and this is what we would have done in our first little mini series, one way fixed effects ANOVA. But I wanted to show you that each of these values that we created, so here's the P value, it's the same. Here's the F test statistic, it's the same. Mean square residual, mean square treatment, and then the sum of squares are the same also. Now in point four, we looked at variance we estimated the variance components and the method of moments was this the you know it's the mean squared error minus the mean squared residual divided by n actually it produced an unbiased estimate too so since these are made in matrix form and then this produces a number i just i put as numeric to you know force it to be a number and so these are the variance estimates. The maximum likelihood estimates we derived also in part four, and it was the sum of squares treatment divided by n minus the mean squared residuals, and then all that divided by n. And we, get, and we got those values. The error variance is just the mean squared error, and then of course the standard error, standard, you know, deviation of the error variance just the square root of it but I wanted to show you that these values are what's produced in R so we load library LME4 which is you know an updated library for mixed effects models so first we're going to fit the model using what's called Rimmel and it uh, produces a much you know, closer to unbiased estimate of your variance components than maximum likelihood. And then if you put Rimmel false, then it uses maximum likelihood. So we have two models created under different scenarios. So let's, let's plot one of these. And so it's the fitted values versus the residuals. And you know what? It sort of looks like a constant variance. We established that on our plot. But the summary here produces this so we summarize the Rimmel which is more of the unbiased estimate so we look at the um, variance components using the method of moments which are unbiased estimates and so look at this variance here and standard deviation it's exactly what we calculated before so it it produces it and the residual variance is here and if you and we calculated it you know manually here now the summary of the maximum likelihood model then let's uh, compare what it produces with what we calculated and so these values are exactly what we calculated 5.1 and 2.258 
it, in part four, we also calculated the determinant of the variance matrix of our model, which is here. And then we showed in that video, actually, I, I really think that video turned out well. Then we found the eigenvalues for that matrix and the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. Then that's what re this line represents. And notice that we get the same thing is if we take the determinant and then actually multiply all the eigenvalues out. Um, so in part five, we do F tests and confidence intervals. And here, it's just I reproduced the fixed effects model because this P value is exactly the same as if it were a random effects model. And I think that's the only way to get that result, which is a little bit disappointing because I'd want it, you know the R to somehow produce that value, but it, I couldn't figure it out. But the way I did do it is we used the log likelihoods to test it. So in this model, I fit a linear model without the loom. So it's just a model with an intercept. And so under the null hypothesis, those tiles are zero. So I take them out and I store the results in the null model. And then if you take two times the difference of the log likelihoods, and I do it for the Rimmel model and for the maximum likelihood model. We get two test statistics, 13 and 11. And then the p-values associated with them are these. And if you remember, well, you don't have to remember, it's here. The p-values are actually very close. This is a chi-squared p-value, and this is an f. But one thing to remember, this f is an exact uh, value and these are asymptotic values and so that, I think that's really the why there's a difference so here we construct confidence intervals we let alpha be 0.05 so we just there's a function called confidence intervals and we take it of the um, we, we put in the maximum likelihood model of the one-way random effects model and then it produces confidence intervals for the variance components and also the intercept and in this video, in part five, we calculated them by hand and we came up with this. So this is a 95% confidence interval for the air variance. Now, notice that if you take the square root of these, we get this. And th this, taking the square root of all this, doesn't produce an exact confidence intervals. And so these are just close. This is going to produce more of an exact confidence interval based on sigma, not sigma squared. The confidence interval for the between variance is this. So, so this is the inner class correlation. So this is a confidence interval for the between variance, often called the inner class correlation coefficient. And the confidence interval for the within variance is this. And I, in part one, we derived the result for the inverse of the variance covariance matrix. So if we store the variance covariance matrix in V, in part one, we uh, showed that this form is the inverse matrix. So let's store that in V1. And now let's compare the results. It, it should, like if we take the product of V and, and V inverse, it should be the identity matrix. And I wanted to show you the difference between all and all dot equal. All compares every component of this diagonal matrix with this V times V inverse. And if they're all 100% equal, then it is true and it's false otherwise. But notice we get a false. And the reason is this VV inverse produces, you know, it's like 0 0.0 to the minus 16th. You know, so it's something that's like so close to zero, but it's technically not zero. So it generates a false. But if we use all dot equal, then it looks 
at that and says, you know what, that's pretty close to zero. I'm going to call it zero. And then when we look at this diagonal matrix, yep, that's zero. So it calls them equal. And so all dot equals a better function to use when you're when you're comparing. Okay, well, this is all I have for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. This is the last video in this little mini series. And next we're going to start uh, one way fixed effects repeated measures design is the next little mini series. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.